Hello, brothers and sisters. I uh, greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, let us pray. Loving Father, thank you for the truth in your word. Thank you that you are forming us into the person you want us to be. You help us to lie willingly in your hands. For we trust you to form us into the vessel that you want us to be. To your praise and glory. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm going to call my brother Ben to come and do the reading of the word of God. Coming from the book of Jeremiah chapter 18 verses 1 to 13. Thank you all. Good morning everyone. Praise be to our mighty God and Saviour. Uh, I thank you Lord for everyone that's watching and I pray that they'll be blessed by Johnson's word today and the, uh, the scripture verse I'm about to read. Uh, just thank you for everything Lord. So as Johnson mentioned we'll be reading from Jeremiah 18 1 to 13. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter, potter's house and there I will give you a message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, he said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so... You are in my hand, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce the nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if another time I announce that this nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted and, it do, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I have intended to do for it. Now therefore say, say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. But they will re reply, it's no use. We will continue with our own plans. We will all follow the stubbornness of our evil hearts. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Inquire among the nations who have ever heard anything like this. The most horrible thing has been done by virgin Israel. Praise be God. So we'll get Johnson back to hear what the Lord's put on his heart today. Bring open ears. Um, if you want to check out some of the other YouTubes, there's some really solid messages there and I recommend doing so. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Brother Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, today I've come up with a theme. Who is in charge here? Who is in charge here? Anyone who works in a hospital emergency room can relate many stories of persons who come under emergency situations and they've suffered what appears to be a heart attack or have stopped breathing for other reasons. They are put on a breathing machine. Some of these persons do not regain consciousness even after they are put on the breathing machines. Then after a period of days or sometimes week, the doctor and family must make the decision to remove the machine. Often it means that the person will not breathe on his own or her own and thus die. Reaching the decision to remove the machine is always a very difficult and painful decision for the family members to make. It often seems to them emotional at least as if they are causing the end of the life of their loved ones. Of course, this is not true. In our text for today, we have a clear declaration by the prophet Jeremiah that our lives are finally in God's hands. 
And he is the one who decides when we will be born and there is to preside when life ends. So what does that mean? However, the advances of modern technology medicine have raised some very serious and deep questions about how much doctors and family members should have to say about ending the life of a person who cannot let their own wishes be known. Who should have the final say? Who is the one who should finally determine when the switch is turned off, the breathing machine or the plug is pulled to stop it? The doctor, the family, or perhaps even the government? The setting of our text for today has little relation to the setting of a modern medical facility. But the root issue which Jeremiah, speaking for God, was confronting in the people was not all that different. Here yeah, we once again have the picture of God's wayward people. Or they certainly didn't think they were wayward people. They actually believed that their superior knowledge and experience led them to make decisions and take actions which were superior to anything God could do. After all, they lived on earth. They tilled it. They cared for the animals who provided meat and clothing. They established towns and cities. And God, where was he? They never saw him. So it was natural for them to want to do things their own way. Because they said, we don't see God, we are doing it to ourselves. Like even what a lot of people are doing today. You have to admit that it was a pretty arrogant attitude and that these people had. And they continued to show how stubborn they could be. In no way would they turn and acknowledge their sinfulness. So the parallel I see between the people of Israel and those in modern hospital who have to make a life and death decision is that it is, is to slip into the belief that they alone actually are making these decisions. The decisions they have made is to use a machine that for many people has great therapeutic value. There are dozens of persons in any hospital who thank God that there was a breathing machine to help them breathe or even breathe for them when they needed it. But suppose that this machine or any others of the miracle machines of modern medicine give us up the power to have control over life and death. That one is not true. It's not true. It's not true. Jeremiah reminded the wayward people of his day that just as they had come from the dust of the earth, they were still like clay in the hands of a porter to God. When the porter doesn't like what he's making, he flattens it, the clay, and it starts over. God could surely do that too when he discovered that his children were wandering too far from the way of life he intended them to lead. So he's telling them that life is in God's hands. This could seem very harsh word, but Satan it needed not to be received as such. Through Jeremiah, God also reminds the people that he is even more willing to forgive them and help them shape their lives into the kind of lives he had envisioned in his people. So which means your life could be reformed, remodeled anew as long as you listen to what God wants. So he urges Jeremiah to call them to repentance so that God can shape them with his creative spirit into the persons he intended them to be in the first place. Which means people have deserted the, 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 the way God has created them for. They have deserted what God has intended them to do. Certainly we need to be reminded of whom our God is as we struggle with many dilemmas with which modern technology medicine has confronted us. Yes, we are responsible to be the very best caretakers we can be of the lives and gifts God has given us. But God is still very clear in charge of our comings and our goings. He is in charge of everything. So we need always to come back to God and ask him for anything that we want. At those times when the momentous decision to remove life support systems is being made, there is often a chorus of persons, including doctors and nurses, who join in reassuring families that they are not making the decision as to whether their loved one dies or lives. They are. They, they are sort of saying, we are not the ones making the decision. And that is true. Each person is still very clear in the hands of God who accompanies you from your very last breath into eternity. 
So what they are doing is just helping, but life is in God's sense. But if there is mercy and abundant goodness when our lives are in God's sense too. Most of the time, death, when it comes after a breathing machine has been removed, is quiet and even peaceful. Let us affirm today that even though we now have machines which can prolong our lives past the time we normally would die and have the power to turn these machines on and off, still our lives finally are in God's hands. Our lives are in God's hands. In conclusion, still he is the porter and we are the clay. Still God is in charge of our world and all of us in it. Still we live by the gift of faith so as to learn more fully the spiritual dimensions of this life we began. We live by it. Let this sermon be the occasion for you to think about and discuss with your loved ones how you feel about the use of life support systems. But as you do, do so with much prayer and health dose of our That is really God who gives us life and every good and meaningful experience in it. Amen to that church. It's only God who gives us life. Not anyone. Not anyone. God gives us life. Whether you are surrounded by a million doctors who have been trained, at the end you will die. Meaning that life is not in their hands. Life is in someone's hands. God is the one in control. But we will try to do what we can by all means to help the individual because of our technology that we have. But only to remember that all is in God's hands. May the good Lord help you as you think over these ways that even the doctors themselves they are just playing in God's own hands. They are just clay. They are nothing without God. May the good Lord help us to shape our belief and understanding to say, where do we come from? Where do we come from? And where are we going? Life is in God's hands. God bless you all from now and evermore. Amen. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the historical record of Israel's history, which has so much to teach us of your plans and purposes for mankind and your goodness and your grace towards us. May we learn from our mistakes and be guided into God living. Thank you that you can be trusted to fulfill your promises to your people, to correct us when we go astray. We pray that we will be faithful in the work you have given us for us to do. And thank you that in you is healing wholeness, hope, and joy for you are our God and our worth of our praise. May the Lord bless us from now and evermore. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's time for us to show our thankfulness and I urge you to take your offerings and just say thank you Lord. Just for us to be breathing is a miracle. That is the greatest miracle we should have never thought about. Just breathing, just like talking like what I'm doing, it's a miracle. It's a miracle and we want to be thankful for just having that life. To say thank you Lord for everything that you have given me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring our offering to you. We want to thank you for everything that you have given us. We know that without you, we can't do anything. But with you, we know that everything belongs to us. Thank you, Father, for giving us this life, beautiful life, and all the material things that you have given us so that we are able to do A, B, C, D in our lives. Just remind us and help us to be thankful. So we come to you and say, thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen.